Good morning, everybody. A special welcome to Robin and Anina. We've been very fortunate over the last few months that Robin presents us with a series of presentations about fascinating international figures who somehow have a connection with um, Hermanus. Today, one of the most interesting and intriguing stories is that of um, Amy Johnson, the first female pilot to do all kinds of interesting things Robin will tell you about. She really was a remarkable pioneer, but it is also a very interesting and intriguing story. And thank you, Robin, for bringing us these stories up. We've enjoyed them tremendously. So thank you. over to you, Robin, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The background to the title slide, which you see now, uh, shows the route which Amy Johnson took in flying from London to Australia. She was the first female pilot to make that trip solo. And I'm going to give you some details about it uh, during my presentation. But I'm going to go way back and, and start uh, when human beings first propel themselves into the air. The story then starts in 1903, when the Wright brothers first uh, made a powered flight uh, with a passenger. Uh, this took place at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina and showed that it was possible to achieve this technological feat. In the same year, the Marine Hotel in Hermanus was under construction. Unfortunately, there are no images of it under construction, but as the Wright brothers took off, the late family uh, laid the first foundations for what has become our most important hotel. This is the earliest shot of the Marine Hotel, about 1914. You can see how rural the situation still is, because roughly where Gearing's Point starts now, cattle were still grazing uh, in 1914. So, uh, it is an, an early photograph, but not specifically dated. The, another coincidence occurred in that the son, the only son of the owner of the Marine Hotel, uh, P. John Late, uh, was also a pilot. And an extract from his mother's diary indicates how he became involved. Early in 1917, Henry, who had just turned 18, left for England with a crowd of volunteers. He joined the Royal Flying Corps and after only three months training, was sent to France. Shortly thereafter, we received news that his plane had been shot down over enemy lines and that he was missing. We made inquiries, but it was only some time after that, that we received a, a laconic letter from Henry, who thought it was all a great lark. His plane had been shot down and had landed upside down in a trench, which was fortunately unoccupied by foreign troops. He had extricated himself and managed to make his way back to the Allied lines without being caught by Germans. The only wound he received was some shrapnel in the neck, which was not serious. You wouldn't have guessed it from that photograph. Many other South Africans joined the Royal Flying Corps and that after the war, they brought aviation back to South Africa where it immediately flourished. Uh, in February 1920, two pilots named Brown and Van Reinefeld piloted planes made in World War I 
from the first flight from London to Cape Town. They experienced three crashes and two replacement planes had to be sent to continue the attempt. Eventually, they covered the distance flying for 109 hours over 45 days. Both were knighted. Also in 1920, General Smuts established his South African Air Force and several aerodromes, as they were called, were built, including this one at Baraguanas near Johannesburg, now adjacent to Soweto, and at Wingfield near Cape Town. The word aerodrome, which has gone out of use, was coined at that time from two Greek words, aero for air and drome for course, uh, as in race course. The only word I can find in English that has drome at the end of it still is hippodrome uh, and, and the other is aerodrome. By 1930, Flying had reached her Myers, and Joey Late writes in her memoirs, in 1930, two of Henry's friends, Bill Williamson and Pat Murdoch, often came down to the summer in their small private planes, landing at Rivera Beach. We call that Grotto Beach. They took visitors up for flips over the bay, and these trips were very popular. Peter, Henry's son, would spend the whole day on the beach with the planes, and the pilots would take him up as ballast if there were not enough passengers. Soon after that, the first British woman, woman pilot came to Hermanus after she had set the record for the London to Cape Town flight. Uh, Joey Late, wife of the owner of the Marine Hotel, records her arrival in this way. Amy Johnson, the pioneering English aviator, came to Hermanus. She was staying with Mr. and Mrs. Henry Herman in Cape Town, and they brought her to the Marine for a weekend. Henry, that's, that's P. John Late's son, was wildly excited, and the two of them spent hours happily talking aeroplanes. Miss Johnson signed a tea cloth for me, which I then embroidered. Before going on to Amy's own flight, let me talk a little about the developments in Britain in private flying in the 1900s and 1920s. The, the time 1905 to 1935 was a time during which people with money were able to buy aeroplanes and fly them privately, uh, more or less at will. Initially, they didn't even have to have a license, but in later years, they, were, they had to take a course and they had to pass an examination. Because they had to buy the aeroplanes themselves, it was pre predominantly the women with wealth and leisure. And they included the one you see here, Mary, Duchess, Duchess of Bedford. This is a relatively early photograph of her, probably uh, still in the 19th century, because she only took up flying at the age of 63. She had been a star female athlete before then and also introduced karate into England uh, as a sport. She flew solo from London to Cape Town in 1930, but not in record time. Uh, she suffered all her life from tinnitus and said that she preferred the roar of the plane's engine, which is a continual ringing in her ears. 
that was the plane that the Duchess of Bedford flew to the Cape. Uh, Lady Mary Bailey, the wife of the mining, South African mining magnate, Sir Abe Bailey, was also very prominent amongst the women pilots of the time. She flew solo from London to Cape Town in 1928. Uh, her husband luckily had uh, considerable resources and he had to send two replacement planes uh, as she also crashed three times on her flight. A third member was Lady Mary Heath. She received her pilot's license in 1927 and was the first woman to parachute from an aircraft in flight. She did this in the flight over England and landed in the middle of a professional football match. That was the Ava Ovian flown by Lady Heath. Amelia Earhart, of course, is not English. She was American. She was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo, which she did in 1932. She disappeared on a round-the-world attempt in 1937. Her body was never found, and she was officially declared dead in 1939. Now, the, the novelty of being able to fly uh, mixed in Britain with the usual British enthusiasm about the aristocratic classes doing anything. And so they gave huge publicity to the flights by these women. And it was into this world that Amy Johnson was born in 1903. Here is a very early photograph of her. Uh, taken in her hometown, Hull, in northern northeast England. However, she was not wealthy and not aristocratic. She actually came from a middle-class family. Her father was a fish merchant and fish broker, which uh, obviously chimes with the Hermas connection. He became moderately wealthy and was able to send his daughter uh, from these houses. This is the first, the red house is the first house of the Johnsons in Hull. And this is their middle class home in the same city. He was able to send his daughter to a good school, the Boulevard School in Hull, and eventually to Sheffield University where she did not distinguish herself and passed with a third class degree in economics. She had no clear career in mind. Uh, a psychiatrist who treated her for depression at the time analyzed several aspects of her character. Amy's personality traits included her tomboy behavior, leanings towards superstitious beliefs, her occasional flight into hermit-like isolation, and her preference for unladylike means of escape. Another trait in her not nature was her schoolgirl delight in being, quote, a fertile liar. She enjoyed telling fibs. It was amusing to enter the world of make-believe. Playful fairy tales and fantasy were fun. However, I assure you that the information which you will now receive is entirely factual. Amy lacked any sense of direction on leaving university. She was immediately, in, she worked as a secretary in Sheffield and a typist for a solicitor's firm in London, but she became interest, interested in flying when she visited the Stagland Aerodrome in North London in 1930. And this is a contemporary picture of it at the time. Uh, a few planes can be seen in the center background 
it's quite a large establishment, of course, and indicates the degree to which uh, private ownership of aeroplanes had grown and how many people had taken it up, mainly as a sport. Very few people worked for commercial airlines at that time. When she went to Stag Lane, they insisted that before she could even apply for her pilot's license, she had to be able to repair the engine of, the, of a plane of the type that she was likely to take for her license. Uh, she worked under the head technician at Stag Lane on a voluntary basis, not paid. And th th they all called her Johnny and not Amy. And she eventually, in 1929, um, was able to take apart and repair an entire engine of a single engine biplane. And she took her license in 1929. Her first and only flight before she left for Cape Town was from Stag Lane Aerodrome to Hull to see her parents. In 1930, she began to plan her flight to Cape Town. She named her plane, the one whose engine she had taken apart and restored, she named the plane Jason. Uh, when asked why she did this, she made reference to the classical tale of Jason and the Golden Fleece. You may recall that Jason heard of the existence of a Golden Fleece and he and a crew called the Argonauts sailed around looking for it. Uh, later, Amy, when she decided to fly to Australia, also explained the fleece as a reference to the booming sheep farming industry in Australia. Uh, this is one of her fibs, of course. The plane named Jason was actually named after the trademark of one of her father's fish products. Her father had put up the money to acquire Jason. She found some more funding. And on the 5th of May, 1930, she set off in this particular plane, flying this route from London to Darwin in Australia. You, you have to remember that there were no navigational aids at all. The pilots had to estimate the speed at which they were traveling and related to the distance that they thought was between one stop and another. They could only locate the stop visually from the air. There was no radar, of course, to guide them. And they could not fly at night at all. That's why there are the frequent stops that you see on, on this particular slide. She had many, well, the route was Vienna, Istanbul, Aleppo, Baghdad, Karachi, Calcutta, Bangkok, Singapore, and then four stops at small islands until she reached Darwin. She arrived in Darwin on the 24th of May uh, after having flown solo over a period of 19 and a half days. One anecdote that is recorded uh, is the following. In India, she surprised an army garrison by landing on a parade ground. And when she reached Burma, she faced her biggest challenge, the monsoon. Outside Rangoon, a bumping landing strip ripped a hole in Jason's wing 
and damaged its propeller. A local technical institute repaired the wing by unpicking shirts that had been made originally from aeroplane fabric, salvaged in the First World War. So if you can imagine, she lands there, she tears the, what, the fabric wing of her plane, and then they take aeroplane fabric that had been used to make shirts, and they unpick the shirts and use the shirts from the original aeroplane to repair Amy's aeroplane. Quite an interesting coincidence. When she first landed in northeastern Australia, she was an instant celebrity and was awarded official parades through Brisbane and London and Sydney and was attended by tens of thousands. On her arrival back in London, there was another parade and she was congratulated by King George V and awarded the Medal of the Commonwealth of, Great, of the British Empire. Several popular songs were composed about her, which have undoubtedly reached the top of the pops if this concept had existed at the time. However, the songs were mainly played live by orchestras at formal dances in her honor, although later 70 RPM shellac records were made. Soon after her return to UK, she met and married another record-breaking pilot by the name of Jim Mollinson, who proposed successfully to her on a flight that they were dual pilots after having known her for eight hours, a case of flying really turning him on. In 1931, she and a male co-pilot, not her husband, flew to Tokyo, also in record time. She then began to plan a solo flight from London to Cape Town, which she did in 1932. Her time for this trip uh, broke her husband's previous record, as well as obviously being the fastest time for a female pilot. It was just over 100 hours actual flying time from London to Cape Town. This is the route that she followed. I haven't got the details of the European stops, but the African stops are shown in this diagram. And the route was determined largely by trying to keep in areas which were still British colonies or where the British had a predominant interest. Also, of course, the town had to have a, an aerodrome and have to have facilities for refueling. You could not vary from this flight path because nowhere else in Africa would you find fuel that hadn't been taken there in preparation for your flight. So if you ran out of fuel, the flight was essentially over. In 1933, Amy and Jim sent an, a record for an east to west rock crossing of the Atlantic to the UCA and were recorded a ticket tape parade in New York. She, they were introduced to President Roosevelt. In 1936, she broke her own record time flying solo from London to Cape Town. It was on the 1932 trip that she visited Hermanus. Hermanus, the Marine Hotel, looked like that at the time. And Henry uh, Loet was farming uh, in Elgin at the time, a farm called Krumdrai, and he is shown here as uh, with the horse that he used for managing the farm.
I'm afraid that's the end of the Jason for a time. The right wing got terribly smashed in that crash, and the left one's also drooping. We're just taking it away now out of the uh, way of the other plane. The governor has just um, greeted her here together with the Lord Mayor. On behalf of the government and the people of New South Wales, I bid the warmest of welcomes to the little woman of whom the Empire is proud today. But I'm not going to make a speech. It's utterly impossible. I'm only going to say thank you to you all very, very much indeed for your hearty welcome. And I just love to be here. I'm so happy to be at Sydney, the goal of my ambitions. And I'm now I'm going to enjoy myself. You've all done so much for me. And I just love Australia. I love you people. And I'm going to enjoy myself thoroughly. Thank you all. And I hope to see something of your lovely city. Goodbye for the first. Amen. Yet another talk to British movie tone news before starting off on what is, I hope, to be my third long distance flight. This time I'm going to try to make the cake in uh, something under my husband's record time, which, as you will remember, was four days, 17 hours, 25 minutes. I know I shall have to work very hard to improve on that. It will mean very little sleep, but my machine has a slightly better performance than his has, and I hope to make slightly faster time. I'm calling my machine the Desert Cloud. I hope um, that passing from the name of Jason won't bring me bad luck, but I think the Desert Cloud is a very pretty name. Well, you know, Amy, I wish you the very best of luck in this trip. And, um, in a way, I wish I were going with you. In another way, I don't. And, um, I hope I'll see you back here in England within about three weeks. Will you be back by then? <laughs> <laughs> Welcoming you here home today on behalf of the Secretary of State for Air, Lord Londonderry. I am also charged by His Majesty the King to convey to you his warmest congratulations on your remarkable achievement. And now I want us all to give three cheers for Amy Johnson. Hip hip! After that, Amy became even more famous. She branched out from being a pilot uh, only and uh, began to uh, run a business in the area of hiring out planes to uh, other learner pilots and posing as a model. Here she poses as a smart businesswoman. And here is an, an photograph from Schiaparelli of her as a glamorous model. In 1940, uh, when the world, world War II began, she joined what was known as the Air Transport Auxiliary. Even then, women pilots were not allowed to participate in aerial combat. But they played a very important role 
by moving planes and people around in England uh, so as not to tie up male pilots who could be involved in the aerial battle over England. The ATA, as it was known, Air Transport Auxiliary, was almost entirely st staffed by f female pilots. Here is a, a shot of, an image of one of those. This is not Amy. I couldn't find an image of her as one of these pilots, but that is the type of plane. And you can see it was regarded as part of the Air Force, there's the Royal Air Force emblem, uh, but not in combat. We now come to the rather controversial issue of her death. In, on the 5th of January, 1941, she left Blackpool uh, to deliver an aircraft to an airfield near Oxford. She seems to perhaps gone far off course because the next time that the, her plane was seen from the ground, of course, uh, was over the Thames estuary. Uh, during the war, sea forts like this had been erected in the estuary to prevent German Navy ships sailing up the London estuary and attacking London. There were ships in the vicinity and they spotted her aircraft uh, losing height and then a parachute uh, floating down. Several sailors then reported seeing two bodies in the water. One was described as fresh-faced and wearing a helmet. The figure called out for help in a high-pitched voice and then drifted dangerously close to the ship's propellers. The Thames estuary looks like that and that was what to become her final resting place. The ship the nearest to her landing in the water uh, was the HMS Hazelmere and the captain of the Hazelmere, Commander Walter Fletcher, dived overboard in the ice cold waters to try to rescue at least one of the two people that had he believed had jumped out of the plane. However, the current was too strong for him and he had eventually to be hauled back aboard the ship where he died later from exposure and shock. The second body, if it ever existed, was never found, but part of her possessions, including a traveling bag that might have been taken from, from, for the second body, was found and her logbook, and both washed up later. There's lots of speculation about how this happened. Why was she f so far off her registered course? Perhaps she was on a secret mission. A more mundane explanation was that she had lot, got lost and ran out of fuel. Then as late as 1999, that is to say, 68 years after the incident, a former member of an anti-aircraft regiment in that area testified that she had been shot down by friendly fire. Yet another story is that a Spitfire squadron patrolling the area asked her for the password of the day, which she did not give. They subsequently opened fire on her plane, which then fell into the estuary. However, none of these explanations have been verified. 
obviously the rumors around her death, the mystery of her death, uh, gave her a certain fame at the time, but it was actually after the Second World War that she became as famous as she did become. There were two reasons for this. Uh, first of all, they, the women's movement in Britain and other countries uh, caused people to pay more attention to people who, to women who had taken over men's roles uh, during the Second World War. And secondly, of course, was the ongoing mystery uh, investigated by many journalists and authors of why she disappeared so far off course. While she was still alive, Amy's popularity caused many songs to be written as tributes to her. The most important of these was one called Amy, Wonderful Amy, uh, which was still available on record during the second half of the 20th century. But then as late as 2003, in preparation for the centenary celebration of her birth, an Irish folk singer named John McAvoy wrote a song paying further tribute to her. I'll play that song in a moment, but Amy actually predicted how she would die. She was chatting to a fellow ATA, air transport auxiliary pilot, as both of them pondered the death of a colleague in a plane crash. Gloomily and prophetically, Amy declared, I know where I shall finish up, in the drink. A few headlines in the newspapers, and then they forget you. Sadly, she was right about being lost at sea, but fortunately, very wrong about being forgotten by the nation or her home port in Hull. Those of you with a literary background may appreciate the reference in the title I've given to the slide. It's a reference to W.B. Yeats' poem, An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. A British Airwoman Foresees Her Death. This is a stamp that was issued at, on the centenary of her birth in 1903. And we end off with the song composed in 23, 2003 by John McEvoy and as a tribute to her. I'll give you a glance at the lyrics so that if the music is drowned out by other sound on the tape, you'll still be able to know what he's saying. I remember when first I heard your story from my dad I think he loved you then, he told me of your dreams to soar above mankind Amy, how he worshipped you and loved the very ground you flew above but now you're gone and all his dreams have faded out of sight And I wonder where you're flying to He used to dream back then that someday he could fly with you upon the clouds In your flying machine and visit Far off places we had never seen. Amy, 
how he worshipped you Love the very ground you flew above But now you're gone with all these dreams Have faded out of sight And I wonder where you're flying to What did it feel like? Flying all alone to Australia. Oh, I think it was rather pleasant flying alone. You see, there's certainly nobody to quarrel with or to contradict you. Nobody to say yes if you say no. Oh, I think it's good fun flying alone. <laughs> what do you think about all the time? Think about, you know, just the little odds and ends as to whether perhaps I'd get a hot cup of tea at the other end or if there's going to be any dinner waiting for me. In fact, I wondered more than once whether I was going to reach the other end at all. Uh, no, Miss Johnson. Oh, that was long ago, way back then, in 1932 or so. You were in your prime, living in a world that you would never know. Maybe how we worshipped you, loved the very ground you flew above. But now you're gone and all these dreams have faded out of sight. I wonder where you're flying to tonight. Saving on behalf of the government and the people of New South Wales, I feel the warmth of welcome to the little woman Sweetheart of the old fire in the how many hearts start beating? Well, I'm not going to make a speech in Adelaide, I'm awesome. I'm only going to say thank you to you Amy, all very, very much indeed for your hearty welcome. And, love the and I just love to be here. I'm so happy to be in Sydney, the girl of my ambitions. And I'm very good to call myself the so much for me. And I just want to say I love you people. And I'm going to enjoy myself. And I wonder where you're flying to. And I wonder where you're flying to. And I wonder where you're flying to. Now you're gone, and all his dreams have faded out of sight. And I wonder where you're flying to tonight. Thank you all. Thank you to John Taylor and my wife Anina, who helped me a great deal with this presentation. And thank you all for watching. Excellent, Robin. Thank you very much. What a fascinating story. I was just wondering, you talked about the ATA, but did any of the women become fighter pilots? I haven't researched that, Kat. I suspect no. not. I mean, I suspect they are, they are not records because none of them actually did fly combat missions. But I'd be open to correction on that. As far as I know, that is, that is correct. Uh, their job really was to supply planes to the men who needed them to fly it. I, I don't think any women ever went uh, out as fighter pilots. Robin, this has been absolutely fascinating and really quite charming. It was lovely. Thank you. Well, this is what interests me about uh, the, hist the local history of Hermoyas. I suspect for a town of its size at the time, perhaps even for a town of its size now, there are more international connections between Hermanus and probably or any other South African town of comparable dimensions. And it's been a great pleasure to follow up on these. What really got me working on it was when I edited the book in those days by Joey van Rainlate, wife of the owner of the Marine, she had an amazing recall when in the 1970s, uh, when she was in her, deep in her own 70s, she dictated the book to her daughter, Burdine, and in it she mentions 268 visitors of some social standing who were at the Marine at one time or another. And whenever the names rung a bell with me, 
I would then start researching the life of that person. And then the life of that person would lead to all sorts of interesting facts and insights and a huge volume of material on even individuals who are not nearly as important now as they were then. And it's, for me, it's filled out an understanding of, of how Hermanus financed in many ways its development uh, in the 20th century uh, by this flood of international tourists of social standing who went back home and persuaded all their friends to come to Hermanus and spend their money here, which sustained us through the depression, uh, the second world war, economically the town was sustained by thousands or tens of thousands of allied troops taking their leave here and uh, set it on a course to becoming the large town that it is now. Robin, what royal honors did she receive? Uh, only the CBE, command of the British Empire, was the only royal honor that she received. But at the conclusion of many of these parades in many cities, she was given a gift, of course, but that was not another royal gift. It was from the town or city in which the parade was held. Well, the CBE is not to be sniffed at. Oh, no, it's not a minor, minor award at all. Thank you for a riveting talk. Could you explain to me why places like Palapi and Broken Hill would have had aerodromes and whether the fuel was for aeroplanes or for other, other forms of transport? It seems so strange to have all those aerodromes in, in outlandish places. Well, the only two criteria that have been mentioned in the history, one is they preferred to land in a British colony, and secondly, they had to land where there was fuel. Why they chose the particular aerodromes they did, uh, that's not, not recorded, what the motivations were beyond those two. They'd have been on the railway line. Oh, that's true, that's true. It's possible that they were thinking that in the event of having to crash land, uh, rescue could reach you rapidly via railway. In those days, much more rapidly than by car or truck. I would assume at that stage, the airline fuel was pretty much the same fuel used for motor vehicles. So as long as there was petrol available, you could use it for the aircraft. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, but you know, as you're flying down Sudan and so on, uh, even fuel for motor cars would not necessarily be available at any particular spot. And remember also that it was quite usual for the pilots uh, to land on any reasonably level field, whether it was uh, an, air, an airfield or not, in an emergency, and then be noticed by the local tribe you would then inform the local chief that one of their gods had come to earth and uh, mm -hmm. as a blessing and please would you contact the authorities so that she could be duly recognized and that's how they found her i assume the aircraft jason has been restored and is being displayed in some museum somewhere uh, that's very likely, but I must say I haven't come across that fact. It was, After the crash that you saw in the video, followed by people actually carrying the plane away, which is quite an interesting historical incident as well, we're all smashed up. The plane was actually repaired, that, that is Jason, was repaired in Darwin, repairing it was basically a question of replacing the wooden struts and other woodwork in the, in the body and the wooden struts in the wings and then stretching some material over them, uh, sewing it all up and taking off again. Uh, it wasn't a major event <laughs> in a sense and, and planes were regularly restored after crashes 
and used again over and over. But in the case of uh, Lady Mary Bailey, uh, who crashed twice on her flight, Sir A. Bailey was sufficiently wealthy and sufficiently influential to have planes disassembled in South Africa and flown as a package to where she had crashed and reassembled there. And then she would fly off in that plane, leaving the wreckage of a previous plane behind her. Robin, thank you very much. Fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, my question, after her flights to Cape Town, did she go back by sea, I presume so? Oh, yes. yes, she returned by sea. Yes, she did. It was a one-way flight. I don't know what happened to the aeroplane. Probably it was shipped back with her on the, on the, on the ship. But, uh, yeah, she, there, there are no record of flights Cape Town, London. All the records were London, Cape Town. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why that was, but uh, that is the case, yeah. She returned by sea. Just a, a comment. My son is a recreational pilot. He lives in Pretoria. And uh, I've been to their establishment uh, on public holidays and the like. And the number of people that fly recreationally is quite impressive. It's taken the place of what you, yachting used to be. Uh, in their words, a yacht is a in the water that you pour water in, uh, money into. But aircraft is a lot easier. And South Africa is well rigged for a recreational flying. He flies down from Pretoria to uh, uh, Manus at least once a year. The Berguans aerodrome was largely uh, a private aerodrome. Uh, it had the light plane flying club based uh, on the farm that had been owned by the Baraguanas family after whom the Baraguanas Hospital in Soweto is also named. And uh, not long after the Second World War, Alan Payton uh, became warden of a reformatory, as it was called then, for black juvenile criminals uh, near the site of the Baragwan airfield. Uh, his son Johnson was at school with me and I visited the reformery uh, one Sunday. Uh, we were only released from the school on a Sunday and uh, actually went to the Baragwan's aerodrome in probably in about 1951 when it still looked much like the picture that you saw. Well, Robin, thank you very much once again for your presentation and for all the preparation and for the wonderful way you put these stories together. They really are fascinating. And thank you too for all of you who joined us. Goodbye.